My name is, um, as our introducer said, my name is Cole Schneiders. I'm with United Way of the Plains, and I'm the Continuum of Care Planning Manager. So Continuum of Care is probably the one phrase in there that you've never heard of before. Um, and what the Continuum of Care is, is it's a federal program. Um, there's one in every community. So um, here in Wichita, our Continuum of Care covers Wichita and Sedgwick County. Um, we also have one in Kansas called the Balance of State, which covers most of the rural areas in Kansas um, and there's a couple others as well in Kansas so it's a federal program federal initiative but it's two things really um, so first thing first it is a community coalition so um, our goal our mission is to make homelessness rare brief and non reoccurring in Wichita Sedgwick County um, as my little bio said, the, the whole coalition is made up of government leaders, it's made up of nonprofits, it's made up of business leaders, it's also made up of community stakeholders. So um, that's everyone from people with lived experience who've lived homelessness to just folks in the community who are really passionate about ending homelessness. And whether they're volunteers or they just want, their, they just want to talk about their unhoused neighbors. But the Continuum of Care is also a grant. So. Um, the grant itself is from HUD. It's a $2.8 million grant, and that's what I help coordinate, is all of the processes that go on with that grant. Um, in that grant, what it funds is all of the different agencies that you see listed there. Um, the one that I added that was kind of floating around before I clicked through is Breakthrough Episcopal Social Services. They're going to be starting a rapid rehousing program um, coming up. It, it'll probably be sometime this summer that they'll start that up. Um, and I'll talk more about each of those agencies and what they do for us in the continuum of care. So a little bit of audience interaction. What do we think the most common reason people are homeless is? Mental illness. Mental illness? Unemployment. Unemployment. Drug addiction. Drug addiction. Incarceration, okay. Lack yeah. Of housing. Lack of housing, that's the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> the number one reason people are homeless is because they don't have a home, um, very simply. Um, now all of those factors definitely contribute to it. Incarceration, um, substance abuse disorders, mental illness, um, not being able to find steady employment. Um, the barriers that prevent someone from being housed are almost as endless as the number of folks that are going through homelessness right now. Every person's situation is extremely unique. Um, and that's why it's so hard to solve sometimes. I know um, Greer here will probably talk more specific about how hard it is sometimes to work with clients and how, how hard humankind has to work sometimes to get folks housed. Um, but you know, each person has their own strengths, they have their own barriers when it comes to homelessness. Um, there's no one size fits all solution. However, there is kind of one size fits all solution, house people. If the problem is that they don't have houses, the solution is just to house folks. So that's why at United Way of the Plains, why the Continuum of Care really believes in this philosophy that's called housing first. Um, so United Way of the Plains, what we do with the money that we raise in our campaigns, the money that we raise from individual donors, estate donors, um, we invest it back into the community, into the that Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the most basic levels. Um, safety, so that's domestic violence safety as well as youth who um, need out of their homes for whatever reasons, emergency shelter, rent and utility assistance, as well as food and security. So we know that without those basics, people are never really going to get out of the cycle of homelessness. You know, it's hard to fight your drug addiction if you don't know where you're gonna sleep that night. Um, it's hard to deal with your mental illness if you don't have a safe place to keep your meds. So Housing First really believes in this idea of making sure that people are housed because that lays the foundation, making sure they feel safe, lays the foundation for improving and self-actualization, you know, just climbing up that hierarchy of needs. But housing, shelters aren't housing, right? So shelters are temporary, they, they do a lot of great work, they get people working through a program and they get people ready for what's next. 
And what's next is housing first and getting people actually housed. So all of the programs you see up there on the slide, Catholic Charities, Humankind Ministries, Salvation Army, um, Sedgwick County Calm Care, United Methodist Open Door, Mental Health Association, United Way, and soon Breakthrough Episcopal Social Services, all focus on housing folks. Um, so we have different like types of housing, so transitional housing. So um, we're just getting folks into housing for a short period of time. They sign a lease and it's more month to month. They may not pay anything. And we're just working those life skills. We're helping them get jobs, helping them get their documentation ready, um, making sure that they're ready for housing. And when they go into housing, they'll be able to stay in it. We also have rapid rehousing. And this is where the housing first model, the rubber really hits the road. It is truly rapid. I've seen folks go from encountering their client, they talk to their client, their client says, hey, I wanna live in this part of town, um, here's what I make per week, because I'm working right now at McDonald's or whatever. Within the week, they'll be leased up and living in their apartment after being on the street for who knows how long. Um, you know, sometimes it's that, it's one week, sometimes it takes a month, but truly rapidly rehousing people, getting them ready, and putting them into housing. Um, and then finally, there's permanent supportive housing. So this is where we give to our um, most in need clients that are willing to go along, willing to go along with the program, so to speak. Um, and it's this belief that hey, we got to get people housed. We got to meet their basic need of safety, of shelter first. After we meet that, that's when the case management really begins. That's when we really start working the client and saying, hey, you've been homeless for five years. You may not have lived in a house in five years. Um, I, I've heard stories of clients um, being scared of the radiator because they've never lived in an apartment with a radiator before and they didn't know what it was, right? And these are grown men, grown 56 year old men. Um, that, that's just a new experience for them. Um, and so what permanent supportive housing is all about is getting folks into housing and wrapping support around them so they can stay in housing. Um, it's more longer term, and so Calm Care is kind of our number one provider for that. Rapid rehousing is really short term. So I like to call it a hand up sort of model where you're paying their deposit, you're paying a few months rent, and then you're just walking with them as they get ready and really into housing. And so when it comes to what we do, oh, I should mention as well, so there's some partners that aren't listed on that slide. Um, these are just the folks that are funded by the grant itself. Um, unlisted partners that we work really close to, um, City of Wichita, so Maggie Ballard isn't here, but I'll speak a little bit about what Wichita provides for the homeless community. Um, they have the Homeless Outreach Team, which is a special branch of um, the Wichita Police Force that respond to calls about folks that are homeless, but also directly serve folks that are homeless. So um, they do some of that really hard outreach case management with people that um, they're living on the streets, they don't wanna go into shelter, but they need someone to walk with them. So that's what the HOT team does a lot of the time. They also provide us with emergency housing vouchers. That's a new thing because of the pandemic. Um, they're special vouchers that they pay, like almost all of your rent, almost all of your utilities, your deposit, furniture for your apartment, all of these things um, to just try to get people housed. Because um, one thing that I've talked a lot about with folks is that housing is healthcare, right? Being in housing is what keeps you healthy. Um, you can see folks living on the street and you know the estimates are one year on the street equals 10 years of actual life. So you can see people in the street and you look at them and you think, oh man, that guy, he's gotta be 60, 70 years old. You talk to him, he's 30. He's just been homeless for five, six years, you know, going through whatever he's going through. So when we talk about those emergency housing vouchers in terms of the pandemic, um, living in shelters that are congregate or trying to keep a mask on or trying to social distance can be really difficult. So emergency housing vouchers were one way we try to really rapidly house people. I mean, I think we housed 146 people pretty much within three months. Like it, it was a very quick process. And Wichita is the second highest utilizer for the emergency housing voucher in the country. Yeah. So uh, kudos to Sally Stang and everyone at that <laughs> program. She is pistol. She's awesome. Yeah. So yeah. she really got people into housing that really desperately needed it. And then they also provide, um, so if you've ever heard of section eight vouchers, so um, I don't, I'll go into the history a little bit. So the way that we used to do things in, in the United States was we'd fund the projects, right? These big apartment complexes that were for lower income people. Um, as we've sort of evolved, we realized, hey, those projects where we just place 
um, lower income people, um, that's not a great system. That, um, that contributes to neighborhood blight. Other neighborhoods don't want you to build projects in their neighborhood. Um, we have a hard time maintaining those properties, especially as funding changes. So what the shift to was vouchers. So um, that's just basically saying, you the client, you pick where you wanna live, if it's within your budget, and then we'll help you pay for it a little bit, you pay a little bit of your budget. Um, so section eight vouchers, um, we in the city of Wichita, we have like 3,000 of them, just for lower income folks. Um, but 300 of those are set aside for folks that are homeless. So that was something that Sally Stang again did for the COC and the homeless community was setting aside extra money just for clients that need a little bit extra help paying their rent each month. Um, they still have to pay part of their rent, they still have to pay their deposit and their utilities, but um, it helps their wages or their um, disability just go a little bit farther. So the final thing I want to talk about, and this is really where United Way comes into play, um, my team. So we, we, United Way isn't a direct service provider. So um, we don't provide any services directly to clients in terms of homelessness. Our clients are the homeless service providers themselves. So um, the number one service that we really provide is coordinated entry. My teammate, Jerea Reynolds, provides that. And what coordinated entry is, um, is a way to equitably serve the most vulnerable clients clients. So when I'm talking about vulnerable clients, we're talking about clients that have been homeless for a long period of time. Um, we're talking about clients that have really high needs, so they might have barriers such as disability, substance use disorder, higher incarceration rights, rights a lot of the things you folks listed. Um, and we also prioritize based on family types. So um, in our city, we have a really strong preference for housing veterans. So veterans um, are probably our number one demographic that we try to house a lot of the time. Um, and when I'm talking about equitable, our goal is when you're looking at a client, you're looking at their race, their gender, um, their religion, none of those factors should be playing into how, how they're housed, right? It should just be the person who has the most need today, I'm serving them, regardless of, um, any, of any of their demographics. And in our community, um, which is a lot better than most other communities, we're almost right on. So clients that come to us for help, we're almost perfectly matching um, clients irregardless of what they need to the right resources. Um, and then finally, the other thing that we provide is a homeless management information system, HMIS, which, you know, I'm always told by our HMIS lead, it's really boring, never bring it up. <laughs> um, I'm passionate about it though, because um, when it comes to serving a transient population, a population that might lose our identification, that might not know what state they were born in if you talk to them a year from when you're talking to them now, um, who might not even know where they are right now. Yeah, we have clients that don't know they're in Wichita, Kansas, any, even when you talk to them. Um, that allows us to have a separate way where we can store information that we do get from them, especially if their condition worsens while they're living out in the streets, because we know it's super unhealthy to be homeless. Um, and just share that data with all of our community members. So Humankind is one of those community members that um, we share that data with, that they collect the data on clients, they share it. So if that client, you know, the, they don't work out at Humankind or um, something happens or they don't work out at United Methodist Open Door, if they go to another provider, we can look at all their information and it's called trauma-informed care where we're not re-asking them all of these really invasive questions about their lives. We can just look at the database and say, oh, look, you're at um, United Methodist Open Door. We got everything we need from you. I can just carry on where that case manager left off. So I'm um, really just trying to wrap the community around these folks. Um, and then also it's super important because when it comes to these things, we know we're a federally funded program, um, even though we do work a lot with private dollars, whether it's the shelters or the providers themselves, um, we wanna make sure that the people that we're funding, the programs we're funding have good outcomes. We're actually housing people at a fast rate. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're using resources in the right way, right? So if we know that we have a high veteran population, homeless, we don't in Wichita, um, we'd wanna focus more resources on veterans. What we're seeing now is we don't have as many veterans that are chronically homeless, so homeless for long periods of time. We just have veterans that are um, housed for a little bit and then they're homeless again and so we gotta wrap services around them to get them back housed. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. Um, I, I did miss talking about um, 
the VA. We do work very closely with the VA as well as other um, federal veteran housing agencies. So SSVF, Supportive Services for Veteran Families is one you may have heard of. Um, and finally, how can you help? So I get a, I was joking with Greer about this. I'm not a fundraiser, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, so the number one thing that you can do is join the continuum of care. So the continuum of care, we welcome everyone to that. Um, we have two virtual meetings every single month um, where we talk about homeless resources, how we're targeting resources. In fact, there's one this afternoon. Um, what we're really looking for, for people to help out, especially people that aren't involved in homeless services, um, folks that have relationships with landlords, folks that have relationships with real estate agents. Um, you know, when I talked about how homelessness is so diverse and there's so many things that go into serving homeless folks, um, it also is true that it requires a diverse kind of people to serve those homeless folks, right? So um, you never know what skills or person you might know that may be able to be an asset to serving our community. Um, also volunteer, so where you may have heard of the continuum of care in the past is the annual point in time count. Um, that's where we go out in the community to folks that maybe aren't accessing services and make sure they're counted. So we have a sort of census of how many folks are actually homeless in Wichita. Um, and then finally, invest. So I call it an investment because, you know, it's really not just giving money to people to feed them or giving money to folks um, to make sure they have a pillow on their head. When you invest in United Way or you invest inside a, with one of our partners, um, you can feel assured that the person you're investing in is really trying to move folks from homelessness to housed. Our goal is never to keep a person homeless. We try to do everything we can to get a person housed, adapt to them, um, meet whatever needs they have so we can get them housed. So when you are investing in us, you know, we're, we're really fine tuned. We've been doing this for uh, since 2008, so 14 years in this community, we've had a continuum of care. We are really focused on um, trying to maximize our resources. So an investment in any of those programs is super important, you know, and especially as inflation is going up, right? Housing people, it costs the same to house a homeless person as it costs to house you, right? So uh, more fundraising is always appreciated. Um, with that, I'll stop talking and I'll let Greer take over. Okay, hello, my name is Greer Cowley, like I was introduced, um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about humankind. I don't know how I'm gonna follow up Cole, cause he is fantastic for a lot of reasons. He also um, is kind of like the ringleader of the continuum of care, which is not an easy job to wrangle all of the shelter support and housing people in our community. So just major kudos to him. He is wonderful, and we are so grateful that he's in our community. So this is just a little trifold um, that talks a lot about what we do at Humankind. I think it's an important representation to understand Humankind is the only service provider in our region that's serving everyone from street outreach all the way to permanent supportive housing, which Cole really hit on, right? How that's the backstop to homelessness. 98% success rate and recidivism of keeping people housed is by providing permanent supportive housing. So, a little bit about, oh, a little bit about humankind is, I'm just gonna scroll. We've actually been around since 1885. If you're not familiar with humankind, we started as um, a group of, of ministers who saw a need to help those in the community that were suffering from poverty and homelessness. Over the years, we have served you know, World War II efforts. We did some work with the women's suffragist movement. We did some work with civil rights. Um, and then we really honed in on homelessness and homeless service providers and providing those services to the people in need. In 2019, we changed our name from Interfaith Ministries, which I think a lot of people, whenever I say that, they're like, ah, yes. It's the same exact organization providing the same services. We just really realized we were not doing the same number of like interfaith dialogues or conversations that we had been doing in the past. We'd been holding conferences. Just like as new CEOs come and go, the priorities of the organization kind of ebb and flow a little bit. Um, but we've really honed in on serving people with humanity and kindness and all of humankind. So that's where the name comes from. Some other accomplishments, um, the emergency winter shelter opened at its new location. Uh, in 2002, our permanent supportive housing, or in 2002, our permanent supportive housing opened. 2012, our emergency shelter opened in its facility. Um, and then in 2021, most recently, the studios opened at Humankind. So those are kind of a quick history of our program. 
So this is our mission statement. I'm not going to read it to you. But basically, it's just saying that we're serving all of um, people in Wichita in need with compassion, with dignity, with humanity. Anyone in poverty, extreme poverty, homelessness, humankind is there to help and support them. So basically, it just said the same thing. Okay, and our goal is to end homelessness. Just like Cole said, um, you know, we have that same belief that it should be rare, brief, and non-reoccurring, right? And so we're grateful for each of you here today to help because it's going to take all of us to make a difference. And I truly believe that we can make a difference. Um, if you look at our values, like I said, humanity, compassion, oh, excellence, and collaboration. Collaboration is a big one. Um, Cole spoke to that as well. It's, he put up that list of all of our partner agencies. It's going to take all of us to come together to make an impact in the community. No single agency can end homelessness. The United Way can't do it. Humankind can't do it. It's going to take all of us to come together. And I think that's a really important thing to note as well. Um, so just a couple of, of like definitions that I think are important. Homelessness is the state of having no home. Poverty is the state of being extremely poor, living below the federal poverty line, and then housing insecurity. So we talk about that too. There's a difference between being homeless and being housing insecure. So if I'm homeless, that means I have absolutely nowhere to go, right? And Cole talked about that point in time count, which is really incredible work that they're doing every single year. They're going out, they're physically, have any of you done, participated in it before, volunteered for the, yeah, one person, awesome, kudos to you, yeah. Um, they do it every year. It was usually in January, a really great way to volunteer and get involved. I'm just going to echo that. If you're interested, even if you can't spend the whole day, just like a half a day, go out, volunteer, get with Cole. It's a really wonderful time um, to get to know the people in our community in need. But housing insecurity are people that might be sleeping in a hotel room. They might be staying in a friend, on a friend's couch. It might be two or three families living together, right? A lot of cohabitation. Um, you know, that's a big thing in some cultures in our community. And that's also considered housing and in, housing insecurity. And we also are trying to help those people as well. Um, so the latest um, point in time count, this year's has not come out yet. Hopefully it'll come out in May or when June. HUD says it's ready. Okay. <laughs> a little pressure there. Um, but the most recent one had 619 people that were experiencing homelessness in our community. They were currently in homelessness. So I think that's kind of an important number. And I don't know about you, but if you think about the Wichita population, it's what, you know, four or 500,000 people if you add in all the suburbs. These are people that need somewhere to go, but I also know that as a community, we should be able to do something about this, right? We should be able to take 619 people off of the streets, no problem, right? Yes, I, well, I will say yes for all of us. We should be able to do this. When we come together as a community, I truly believe that we can. Yeah? Is that the number of people that they use like 619 in Wichita are actually on the street? That was at the point in time count. I think this is the 2020 number. It was 593 and then it went up to 619. Um, it's just one one day. So I can let Cole speak. One, yeah, so it is. <sighs> mm. I will not get at my soapbox about data collection and how much I dislike the point in time count. Um, the data for the point in time count comes from our providers and comes from physically going out and counting folks, but it's just one night in Sedgwick County. Um, what's more accurate, you know, we can talk about the amount of households we serve and we served last year. Um, we served 1,413 different households. And a household can be one person or it can be a whole family of 10, you know? Um, so that's probably a closer number of how many unique people experiencing homelessness accessing services. And it's, it's, it's the number they have for the school kids is way higher because uh, they have a different definition. Yeah, so that is, yeah, that, that's another, yeah, really niche issue, right? That when we talk about homelessness, we have to use the HUD definition, which is um, a person who doesn't have a safe place to live. Um, and what Greer was talking about, that housing insecure, that's where the McKinney-Vento homeless youth number really comes in, where if your family's doubled up, there's not enough um, beds or sleeping rooms in your house, that counts as homelessness. We can't count that just because um, we're HUD numbers and we're really focused on the people that you see downtown in our community that are walking around and need assistance. Excellent questions though. Um, yes? Is that like a normal number that it has been for the last decade or something or has that increased more? Oh, 
how did you know that that's what the next slide was? It stayed around uh, somewhere in that area between 500 and 600. Um, the point in time count this year too, I think is going to be lower because it was done on the day that we had, you know, when there was a blizzard every Thursday, right? It was like Groundhog Day um, for two months and it was done on one of those Thursdays. So they didn't go out and physically count as many people. So I think the number this year might be a little skewed. We'll see, it hasn't been released. COVID yet. has really changed how folks oh, use shelters. Everything. So we'll see. So there's a, there's a specific reason for the count. So typically it's done in the last week of January for two reasons. January is around the country is the coldest month of the year. Last 10 days, that's when most people's SSI or disability money runs out. So they're typically on the streets or they're forced to access shelters because there's nowhere else for them to go. So the reasoning, the rationale is it's easier to count folks um, in, on that last 10 days of January. This past year, because of COVID, we decided to move the count to February and we did it the last 10 days of February, February 23rd this year. That, that's a nationwide. It's a nationwide yes. effort. So like I said, continuums of care are nationwide, point town count is nationwide. We report these numbers to Congress to hopefully give us more funding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great questions. Any other questions on that? Okay. Um, so we kind of talked also, I'm gonna skip over a lot of this, the root causes of homelessness. Um, a big one is a shortage of permanent supportive housing. Um, the latest number says that we are short 44,000 units in Wichita. That's just Wichita. 44,000 people do not have, there's no apartment for them to go to, no home for them to rent because it's not affordable, right? Cole talked about there's people that are working. We have people in our shelters that are working a full-time job, 40, 50 hours a week, and they're still homeless because there's no affordable living, right? There's nowhere to live, minimum wage is so low. There's a lot of, it's a very complex issue. And so I think that that permanent supportive housing and the lack thereof plays into a, a, immensely the issues of homelessness in our community. Another issue is mental illness. Um, you know, they say that 56% of individuals who are homeless have a mental illness, which Cole talked about. Substance abuse, 41% of people who are in homelessness have a substance abuse disorder. They say over half of people in homelessness have both mental illness and substance abuse disorders. Um, and ComCare is our big provider in the community and they are so short staffed that, I mean, the wait time to get into to ComCare is, and it's no fault of ComCare, it's a systematic issue in our community and a systemic issue. And if only Maggie Ballard was here. Um, you know, also generational poverty, you know, the poverty cycle, people are born into poverty, they typically die in that same um, socioeconomic status. So that's a big issue as well. And this is a list of our partners. Just like Cole said, we cannot solve this problem alone. It's gonna take all of us, it's gonna take all of us in this room, it's gonna take everyone at the continuum of care to really, truly make a difference. Um, talked about different types of homelessness. There's people that have experienced homelessness, you know, this, the definition is three times within a year. So like Cole said, you might be housed and then, you know, maybe you have mental illness issues and you fall back into homelessness and then you get housed and then, you know, it's just sort of ebbs and flows. Um, the second type is chronic, which we talked about as well. Um, he talked about as well that permanent supportive housing. There's a set aside units in the community for people who are chronically homeless, which is, um, very difficult to get into, but it's also why that HMIS system is so important. So if you're chronically homeless, you have to be homeless for 12 consecutive months or 12 months in a three-year period, right? So that in itself, and you have to prove it, and you have to have a diagnosed um, like mental illness or, you know, some type of disorder or disease or, you know, something. And that also has to be diagnosed and recorded. And so that's why HMIS is so important is so that he can, you know, if Breakthrough Club is getting ready to launch their um, housing, they can go in and say, hey, we can prove, you know, Greer was homeless here in January, here in February, you know, and kind of prove that. So that's why it's so important. It's also incredibly difficult to get into, to be able to prove all of that. I barely can keep track of my own belongings, right? Like my social security card, my driver's license. I'm always calling my dad. I'm like, do you have it? No, I don't have it. So imagine being homeless and trying to keep track of all those records and then trying to keep track also to qualify for housing. Yeah. 
So HMIS is a big way to prove it. Um, you can get like referral forms. A lot of times people will come in and be like, hey, can you sign this form proving that I was here on these dates? But HMIS is the big one. Yeah, so prove, proving homelessness is just saying, hey, I have nowhere to go. I'm not housing insecure. I have no friends or church I can turn to. I have nowhere to go. Um, and that's when we call them homeless. So they self-report that. I'm sorry, HMIS is the Homeless Management Information System. So when we talk about chron documenting chronicity, uh, it's a problem in our community because it's, like you said, difficult to do. Clients can only self-report for three months. So if you're talking to a client who um, may have a, you know, gaps in their memory just because of the nature of their um, disability, um, they may not be able to account for where they've been. So that's where HMIS comes in to help us track. Okay, well, he's been, he's been eating meals at United Methodist Open Door. He's been eating lunch there for the past three months. We know he's been homeless for three months. Before that, he was at Humankind for two months. You know, going back and documenting it, they can report up to three months of their own chronic homelessness. Um, but, you know, a lot of these folks, they might have family. So um, I was talking to a gentleman. Um, he stayed with his aunt. He lived with his aunt. They got in a fight. He was kicked out. And he said, this is like the 20th time it's happened. Like, I live in Wichita, and my aunt will let me in for a little bit, and she'll kick me out because my substance use is so bad. So HMIS just helps the whole community keep track of individuals. I've had several people tell me that they have to, to prove homelessness, they have to uh, stay at a shelter for a certain number of nights or, or connect with an agency. And there are a lot of the homeless population that I encounter that are afraid of any agency or shelter. They don't know anything. So how do they, how are they being homeless? I, um, I think street outreach is a big part of that. Um, Humankind is one of the largest street outreach providers, so they go out from April to October, and they will physically go to the streets to, you know, play. there's like a big encampment at Pawnee and Broadway behind that Walmart. Um, they'll go to abandoned buildings, ten cities, under bridges, and they will physically talk to people, and they record all that information then in HMIS. If you can't tell, HMIS is very important. <laughs> I think we've said it like 30 times. Um, but that's how a lot of people, but you're right, it is a huge issue. That's why proving chronic homelessness is so difficult, right? We're setting people up for failure. But homelessness is just, where did you sleep last night? I slept on the side of the road. You're homeless. That, it, it's as easy as that. It's, it's supposed to be really yeah, you said that easy definition. Yeah, for you that was the only issue with that, yeah. yeah. How do the shelters actually work? I've heard that they, uh, you have to be there by a certain time. That's why at uh, uh, Lord's Diner sometimes they'll have a good turnout and other times not <clears throat> because they want to make sure they can get into shelter on a cold night. Mm -hmm. And then do they have to be gone during the day? I mean, I've heard that mm -hmm. too. Yes, so there's different types of shelter in, um, so I kind of skipped ahead a little bit, which is fantastic. Um, one of the things that's in here is it says emergency winter shelter and humankind is the only emergency winter shelter that is no barrier, meaning we will take anybody, any reason, you have mental illness issues, you have substance abuse issues, you are currently on substances when you come into our shelter. We will take anyone and everyone in need um, and it's open, you're correct, it's only open November through March. And that is because that's the greatest need. Those five months are the coldest five months of the year, and that's when we've realized is the greatest need in the community. And you are correct that it is just open. It's a nightly shelter. Clients can start lining up, like they're doing in this picture, at 5 p.m. There's one facility for men, and then there's a separate facility for women that's a little bit hidden away, um, just because a lot of women have experienced domestic violence or sexual assault or things like that, and we want to be um, you know, aware of that and we want to make sure that we're being uh, kind to what they've had experienced. Um, and so they come in at 6 p.m. one by one, like you said, and they do leave in the morning at 7 a.m. And you might say, why? I will tell you. We don't want to duplicate services. All nonprofits, I mean, across the world are operating on a very tight budget, right? We don't have a ton of surplus um, and we want to make sure, I talk with my hands too much, we want to make sure that we're using our dollars and the dollars that we're raising appropriately. So for example, United Methodist Open Door is fantastic. We love them, we work with them. Breakthrough Club, fantastic. We love them, we work with them. And so they provide services in that gap when we're not open. They have showers, they have laundry, they have mailboxes, you know, they have all those things that we can't provide and we don't want to duplicate services. 
So that's why we're only open at night. However, if the weather's bad, like when we had, you know, the Thursday blizzards for two months, we stayed open. The HOT team, the homeless outreach team that's part of the Wichita Police Department, we called them up and they came and took people, like so they didn't have to walk. That we picked them up and took them, you know, Union Rescue Mission or to Open Door or wherever it might be um, to try and eliminate some of those barriers because transportation is a huge, huge barrier in the homeless community. So we have emergency shelter. Um, we also have the inn. Oh, and we served 8,786 bed nights. So those are how many beds were filled throughout the entire year. We also have the inn, which is our year-round shelter. Uh, it's a 60-bed facility located at 320 East Central. Um, on here, it's considered extended shelter. Um, most clients stay between 45 and 60 days. It's the only facility that takes men, women, families, and their pets. Um, so we accept dogs and cats as well. This gentleman in the picture actually had been on the streets for months and months and he refused to come in because he had a dog. Um, I, would do, I have a dog and I would do the same thing, right? I'm not gonna leave my dog outside. It's number one, it's my security, it's my safety, it's my comfort, right? It's like a mental, um, you know, protector, right? It's your friend. It might be your only friend on the street, so you're not going to leave your animal. So that's what was really great. We worked with Kristen Scare at Scare Vet Clinic um, to create a whole pet program, and you know, we have dog kennels, a cat house for people so that they can bring their pets in and work on their issues. We'll feed them, we'll take them to the vet and take care of all their shots and everything they need, um, and then when they're ready to go back on, they can take their animals with them. So that's a more longer term. It's not, like you said, it's not emergency shelter. You stay all day, all night. You stay as long as you need. You work with a case manager. You address your issues so that then you can move into hopefully permanent supportive housing. The next thing is the studios. So um, that's our brand new shiny project that we just finished in October. Um, Cole was saying he came to the open house for that. And that is um, intermediary housing. It's not transitional. Transitional housing typically has an end date, right? Like it's 12 months or 24 months, and there's typically a program you have to follow through, right? Like you have to attend this, you have to, you're gonna progress to this step and this step, and then you're gonna be on your own. This is really great because it's client-focused, client-based. It's whatever the client needs, whether they're staying for three months, six months, 12 months, they stay as long as they need. Um, and for some people, this might be success for them, right? Um, our clients, and like the guy in the bottom right, his name's Robert, he's one of our first clients who moved in, and he'd been homeless for 10 years. And this was the first way that he was able to get into housing because, you know, like we talked about, all those excellent ID opportunities, he didn't qualify for. He didn't, have rent, he didn't have rental history. He didn't have a driver's license. He couldn't pay a deposit, right? There's all these barriers that we may not even think about. Um, he actually got one of the emergency housing vouchers that Cole was discussing, and they pay the deposit. They pay their application fees. They pay everything that you're going to need so that you can literally just move in. And that was a huge lifeline for him because otherwise he would not have been housed. He wouldn't have qualified for housing. So they get their own furnished apartments. It has little kitchenettes, uh, their own bathrooms. Um, there's a community room. There's a big kitchen in there. There's a conference room. Um, and it's designed to build independence. It's designed to teach life skills. Um, there's case managers that work there. And it's just a really great place. I would love to have any of you come out and see it. Um, and we can accept 54 people at a time. And the goal is then after, you know, six to 12 months, people are going to move out. We're starting to see that. We've had three or four people move out already. We just opened October and they're, we're letting more people in. So it's continually moving people off of the streets and into housing. And then the hope is they'll move into permanent housing. Yeah. Correct, yes. The studios, is, good question. The studios is only for individual men and individual women. Nationally, about 70% of people in homelessness are individuals. So this really fits a good need in the community. And these are teeny tiny. They're like 500 square feet. And so it'd be difficult to fit more than one person in there. Uh, it's at 1011 North Topeka. It's at Topeka and Broadway, right by St. Francis, yeah. Uh, is it full? Oh, it's full, yeah. This is. Um, there is a waiting list right now, yeah. And it's the former 316 Hotel um, that was on North Broadway. We had the city and the county said, hey, we have some extra CARES money. They asked a bunch of people, would anyone like to do this? And humankind were the only ones that said, yeah. So I don't know what that means about us. But. Did you say that's a success or did you see more of them? 
I is this better than voucher? Um, so uh, vouchers are accepted here. So this isn't. It's, they're not accepted. They, they are accepted here. Are. Yes. So like that man, Robert, he's on an emergency housing voucher through the government. So vouchers are accepted here. Yes. They can move to a, from this to a section A place if things got more seriously stable. Yeah, absolutely. They can also take their emergency housing voucher with them too. So they can move to any other apartment on their emergency housing voucher. Yeah. Wouldn't the rents be more stable too? I've been hearing that the rents have skyrocketed here in Wichita. I've been hearing up to 200 a month. I believe it, yeah. Um, and so wouldn't the rent on something like this be more stable? Like they, like this, because it's a nonprofit, it's not trying to, to gouge. Right. Yeah. So rent here is $500 a month and that's all bills paid. And you might be thinking, why would we charge rent to someone who's homeless? Um, and we're trying to build life skills, right? We're trying to teach people how to pay their bills on time, their responsibilities. They have to sign a contract. They sign a lease when they move in. And if they break that lease after six months, there's no penalty. We want them to move on. Um, but we're building those life skills. So yes, it is $500 a month to live here and that does not cover our costs. So you're correct. But also there's other permanent supportive housing they can move to that would maybe be a one bedroom or a two bedroom. Some people, maybe they've lost their kids and so they're trying to get their kids back or they've, you know, they've lost touch with their family and they're trying to find their family. And so this is a really good place to call home while they're working on those issues. Like Cole talked about housing first. You've been talking about partnerships and stuff. I've heard that there's a move from the city to follow up Austin, Texas, one stop <laughs> the San Antonio Haven for Hope. Oh, yeah. Is, is, that, is that viable or is that just a pipe I don't know. I mean, that's this is one step in the right direction for it. Like I've said, it's going to take all of us, right? Um, it can't work for humankind to be the only ones to build, you know, this big, beautiful thing. Um, it's going to take all of the partner agencies, it's going to take the city, it's going to take the county, it's going to take all elected officials to come together and say, hey, we need to make a difference and we need to make a change. It's going to take the United Way coming along. Um, and so we're, there's definitely discussion of it. Haven for Hope is a big one. There's one in Denver. There's one in Las Vegas. That's like a big campus. Um, so there's, there's discussions, but nothing's been decided. And the other thing, the Union Rescue Mission has just bought a building downtown and they're working on it. They don't partner with the um, government agencies, is that right? Or they don't receive any government funding, but they do work with the continuum of care. They do work with the um, yep. Yep. excellent. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know what Union Rescue Mission is doing. They're yeah, they're faith-based. They're fantastic. If, if you've never heard of them, they focus solely on men. They have a faith-based mission, so they really want um, to teach men, you know, um, you know, principles of faith and move people through their program. But um, they've also admitted, hey, we're, we're part of this bigger community. We we all see the same people, so let's work together, even if we don't want to receive federal funds. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, they have job training. They have a bookstore, I think, that they're teaching. It's part of their program. It's more transitional housing. They also have an emergency shelter. Um, they're one of the other larger providers in the community that has an emergency shelter. However, it only accepts men. So that's the only caveat to them. Yeah. Here you go if you have a family. You said there's not that many families, but so, what, kind of, what kind of shelter? So families are actually the population we take the best care of in Wichita, Kansas. We have um, Humankind accepts families and they work really well with families. We also have Catholic Charities. They have St. Anthony Family Shelter and the Salvation Army has um, their emergency lodge. All, all of them accept families. There's also Family Promise, which accepts families. Um, they, rather than a set shelter, they rotate families through different congregations that accept the families, let them live there over the night, and then they spend the day working on life skills in, their, in that house. Um, when it comes to families, our outcomes for families, 67% of the families we see return to permanent housing. So whether that's um, a new house with them or um, they're going back to live with family or something like that, where most of the population population is right around 30%. So the single folks, a lot harder to house than families. Does Habitat for, fam Habitat for uh, Humanities work with you guys at all? Or? 
So See? Habitat for Humanity actually is in the other half of our office at Humankind. Um, so we own the building and they lease the other half of it. They have a lot more steps. They're fantastic. We love them. They actually have an event on Friday if you're looking for something to do called Raise the Roof. It's going to be great. Um, they're wonderful. They have, theirs is more towards home ownership. There's a certain level of income you have to have. There's a certain expectation. There's a program you have to go through. A lot of our clients wouldn't qualify. Potentially some clients in, in our apartments, which is the next slide, um, would qualify, but the majority of them do not. I don't know how closely you guys work with them. It's, yeah, it's harder. So right now with the money that we have and the way the resources are given to us, it's easier to get someone to an apartment um, and then look at home ownership as a long-term option. Now there are people that leave shelters um, after purchasing a home, like it, it does happen, um, but it's a little bit more difficult to make that happen. So the last slide, I could go on forever, but the last slide I'm gonna talk about is our permanent supportive housing and our case management. So we provide case management at all levels. In street outreach, we have a guy named Jerry who's been doing this for 25 years. Amazing guy, incredible guy, the calmest, kindest person I've ever met in my entire life. He's going out weekly to meet with people, um, providing case management. What do you need? How can I help you? We've been talking for two years. Do you think you're ready to yet to come into shelter? No, okay, I'll come back next week. Are you ready now? No, okay. Just super, super um, patient guy. We provide case management at the, the inn, which is the top picture. That's a woman named Wendy and her three kids who um, were able to get into housing. We provide case management at the studios, which is the bottom picture. That's a gentleman who's living with us. Um, it's really the what we think is the most important step in getting people into housing is like Cole talked about, that wraparound services, right? We have to support clients and we have to provide them with the services. Like he said, people are afraid of radiators. We've had people who've washed their clothes and dishwashers because they didn't know. They've never had a dishwasher. So they're not gonna, them in the oven. yeah, <laughs> you know? Or, you know, they've just never had those, those luxuries that we really take for granted. When clients moved into the studios, we had to do a, we didn't, had not even thought about this. We had to do a whole life skills training on how to use the washing machine, right? The washers and the dryers that hadn't even crossed our mind that that's something that they would be needing. And they've, because they've been on the streets for 20 years, maybe they don't know how to use one. Um, and so that's really what we think is the most important thing um, is providing case management to have someone walk alongside with you while you're on your journey. Yeah. To qualify for the case management, do you have to be like active? I work with families who received an eviction notice and they know they're not going to be able to get into a place by that eviction date. Would you work with them before then? Or would it be after? So our case management is only for our clients. Um, however, I would recommend if they're looking for somewhere now to call the inn, to call St. Anthony Family Shelter, that would probably be the best location would be St. Anthony Family Shelter um, if they're like a, a family unit. Struggle with shelters is they won't work with you either until you're and that that comes right back to the fact that shelters are trying to meet the gap by accepting federal funds and the federal definition of homelessness is um, you're either homeless or you can be at risk of homelessness and that at risk, at risk of homelessness is you have a 14 day notice or you know you might have a 1430 you have an eviction coming um, you can't enter a federally funded shelter until you um, until it's imminent, yeah, so 14 days. So, you know, they can go in, but um, depending on what's going on with them, the shelter might have to prioritize someone who's living in their car. You know, that, that's the, the stark reality of it, because that person in their car is right now, right now at this moment, the most in need. And I think also there's, um, there's enough shelter beds for everyone that's homeless in our community but there's not enough shelter beds without barriers, right? Like we talk about Union Rescue Mission, they have so many shelter beds that are just for men, right? And Humankind has so many shelter beds that are, you know, no barrier, only open for five months. Or, you know, St. Anthony only takes families, you know, or whatever it might be. And so there's a, a plethora of them, but maybe not for the specific need. Would you disagree with that? I can see your face. It depends on the time of year, right? Because we know that folks, um, may come back here during the summer months when it's warmer. The folks that don't have as, as uh, severe of issues, um, there are folks that just refuse to go to shelter because no shelter 
meets with their lifestyle. They, they just can't live in a shelter. Um, you know, there's a, a young man, he was 25, I'm only 23, so you can imagine calling him a young man. Um, he had so many PTSD issues, he couldn't sleep the night. So he had to walk around at night, and most shelters can't work with you if you need to be walking around at night, because they have set curfew. Um, so right, so you know, it comes down to that person. What can we do to accommodate the individual? Yeah, but I also just want to—I've said this already. Like, I truly believe that Wichita, the homeless population, there's a solution, right? You talked about you know Haven for Hope in San Antonio. I'm not sure what that solution looks like in Wichita, but I know that if we can all come together, we really truly can make a difference. It's just going to take all of us coming together and saying, okay, let's tackle this head on. And I think it's going to take the city and the county and all these nonprofits, really. Yeah. Do you feel like that our um, city and our county, our elected officials, the people that, you know, are kind of in power, do you feel like that they're supportive of these and they want to solve the problem? Or do you think they just give lip service to it? I mean, how easy what are a question that was. <laughs> how do I dance around that? I, know, I need to look at my communications person yeah. for a few minutes. I'm going to look at your communications person, too. I think that everyone's doing the best they can do. I think that the studios was a step in the right direction, right? Providing $4 million in CARES funding to provide this facility that we otherwise would not have been able to do, right? I also think the city and the county are being pulled in so many directions and it's just about you know priorities and timing and there's a lot of just like homelessness is a complex issue funding it is a very complex issue so that's my non-answer do you have a non-answer i mean my my only addition <laughs> to your non-answer is that it can feel overwhelming you know i come to this job every single day i've been talking to angie prather she's our um vice president of communications something like that at united way um and she said you come in here every day with a smile on your face how do you do it i don't know but um it is immensely complex down to the person it can be so so complex to work with them um, and all the issues that they have going on you extrapolate that over the whole population you know 619 in one night um that can be a really hard issue for a government official to say, how do I, how do, I do anything about that? You know, I, I guess I can put a little bit of funding here or there, but I, I got to worry about all of my housed city that is, you know, that, that's voting for me and paying taxes and all of that. I got to focus on them sometimes more than I could focus on these unhoused neighbors. And 619 today could be a different 619 tomorrow, right? Yeah. Would Medicaid expansion provide any additional resources for the population Yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think to echo, to kind of piggyback off of that, there's talk about ComCare expanding. Like we've said, ComCare is a fantastic partner. This is no, no disrespect to them. They're underfunded, right? That's just a statement of fact. They don't have enough funding. They don't have enough staff. They're completely understaffed. Their crisis hotline is completely understaffed. And so it's really difficult to get anywhere, right? So Medicaid expansion, ComCare expansion, it's just going to take a lot of us coming together. I think that's the, the theme and of it. Homelessness is a systems issue, right? Like homelessness is not, it's everything from low minimum wage to not having, you know, 44,000 housing units stocked short for affordable housing in our city. No developer can build 44,000 housing units in, in a year, you know, that, that's a huge unmet need. And we don't have enough federal, um, Section 8 vouchers to actually meet the need of our community. Only three in 10 people in Wichita that actually are eligible for that um, rental assistance can actually get it because we have so limited rental assistance. The city does everything they can. Um, something that, that blew my mind when I learned about it is the city and the county split how they did services a few years back, I think 10, 12 years ago. City said, you know what, we'll take over housing. We'll take all the federal money for housing, all the community money for housing, we'll focus on housing. County, you take care of mental health. And the county's been doing that with ComCare, they've been working with MHA, Mental Health Association. Um, but 
things have gotten more expensive. There's not as many young people entering social work. There's not as many people willing to do the job. Um, the pay for social work isn't as great. And you're encountering folks that are trying to serve people in crisis while in crisis themselves. And, and it's just not sustainable. Um, I could go over like 30 different problems we have in the homeless services yeah. system. So we don't believe that homelessness is the problem. Yeah. We believe that homelessness is an effect of poverty you know, mental illness, all those things. So just to clarify that, we don't view homelessness as a problem in our community. We view it as an effect of all these other issues. How much federal money do you actually get? Do you percentage? I mean, how, how important is the federal money, state money, local money? What's... Mm. I'm not, I mean, I can say that the COC grant, we get $2.8 million, you know, if we get funded every single year. Which is um, not very much. Not very much. We do a lot with $2.8 million, um, and we match it 25% with locally raised funds. Um, likewise, the city, they get ESG money that they distribute out. It's like 250000 uh, sorry, emergency <laughs> solutions grant dollars. So for comparison, places there are cities in Texas, like Austin, Texas, that their COC budget is $60 million. And you, six, 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 $60 million. Bigger, it's a bigger city. Now granted, it's a bigger us. city. It's a bigger city. However, and yeah, and then, I mean, Places like Oklahoma, I went down and toured in um, Oklahoma City with our CEO, and we said, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful building I've ever seen. How are you funding it? And they said, oh, well, homeless services falls under the Department of Health, and so we get allocated so many millions of dollars every year. And the CEO and I just looked at each other like, wow, we get allocated zero. But I think that we're, it's, it's a systemic issue. It's gonna, I'm gonna just continue this. It's gonna take all of us coming together. Humankind is privately funded nonprofit. We do rely on some government grants, like the Emergency Solutions, um, another one called ESFP. We do have some chronically homeless um, apartments that are funded by HUD. So there are very small chunks that we are funded by the government, but I would say 95% of humankind's budget is private individuals making donations, writing a check for $20. So yep. you're saying that the Oklahoma money comes from the state? A portion of it. A portion of it does. Yeah, so, if you look into their Department of Health, their Department of Health funds homeless services. And I'm not, that's, I mean, I'm not saying like that's what the solution is here. I'm just saying that that's how it's funded and it's just different here. Every state handles it differently. There, there's some weird things like this. Last I knew, you couldn't get a drink of water from a water fountain in Wichita. Uh, last summer, the because of COVID, they, because of COVID, well, they, uh, they either turned off or removed water fountains around the town. Oh. Please verify this for me. But a uh, lady in the sack lady uh, was parked herself on Third and Topeka across from St. John Episcopal Church with uh, a cow tank full of water and ice, all uh, about three to four months last summer. Uh, I remember that. You know, uh, it's, it's unsustainable because people like things like bathing at night and nobody's there. Well, not lots of times it's okay, but we, uh, it's, it's part of the humanity and in the time, you know, you, you, you live that, but people be water. Um, and the community, maybe if there be a way to fix that this year. I don't have water in the and showers. Yeah. And trash cans. Yeah. Trash, parks need trash cans. Did they take the trash cans out of the parks? Uh oh. I don't know. I, I imagine the trash cans are there, but probably they're Oh, and, and like we serve breakfast at our church, and we've been serving it to go, so we make trash every week. Uh, COVID has definitely put a wrench in things. I think we're getting back on. The, I, 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 yeah, I, yeah, I think we've all, we can all agree there's a systemic issue, systematic issue in our community. And um, I'll just say it one more time, we all have to come together to make a difference. Um, and so it's gonna, it's gonna take all, not just the city and the county, they're not gonna be able to fix the problem. All of us together, collectively.